All right, good morning, everyone. I am Jesse Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocates. It is great to see all of you this morning. And I'm so excited about today's panel conversation around opportunity youth because we have um, just a really great group of panelists. And I know a lot of you uh, who are on today are really passionate about this topic and care deeply about these young people that, that we'll be talking with today. So uh, just a reminder that we are recording today's forum as both a video and a podcast. So we ask that you stay muted, but if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to drop those into the chat and um, panelists will try to address those or um, we'll try and pass them on to our moderator to ask uh, or we will address those um, later or in the chat. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Terry Brooks. Hey, good morning, Jesse. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention that uh, Jesse, who those of you who have joined us for 50 or 60 of these know that her role is hostess with the mostess. You know, do you believe she turned, I think, 30 just yesterday? So I hope we all can, you know, like, message her, belated happy birthday, et cetera. So uh, I thought we were going to open by singing happy birthday, Jesse, but I guess, yes, we did. Uh, so we want to welcome everybody. Uh, I want to open by making just two or three observations. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you up front, you're going to, I hope one, I hope a couple of them shock you. I think a couple of them you probably will not agree with. And then I also hope that they uh, make are provocative and cause you to think. So let's make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, and again, we have folks who are uh, have more expertise than I do. So I'm sure they will correct me when I'm uh, incorrect. But uh, what we're talking about today are young people aged 16 to 24 who, frankly, are lost. They're not in school. They're not employed. If you're 16 to 24 and you're not in school or you're not employed, I think we all can guess that the narrative is not all that good. So let's get a grip on what we're talking about. The thing that I hope disturbs you is that in Kentucky, we have over 70,000 young people who fit that category. So I don't know what paints the picture to you. Is it that if this group of young people were a school system, it's the second largest school system in the state? Or, or maybe if you're like me and know that it's 51 days until college football kicks off, uh, do you know that uh, the young people that we're talking about today could not fit in uh, Cardinal Stadium or Kroger Field? I mean, we're not talking about a small band of Kentuckians. We're talking about 70,000 young people who are depending on you. There are some challenges in moving this ahead, <clears throat> and I would suggest a couple. Uh, one is that, that a group like this has to get really smart and intentional as to what we're talking about. Is it a federal, is it federal action, state action, or local action? Correct answer, D, all of the above. But we've got to know what we're talking about. The, the other area that I would suggest, and this is where some of you are going to disagree with me, so I'm just telling you up front. I think we have a real, uh, I, I hate to call it a marketing challenge, but that's what I'm going to call it. Uh, we have got to make these young people an important priority to lawmakers. There's a couple problems with that. Uh, you know, I know the new politically correct phrase is opportunity to do. Uh, I got to tell you, political market research tells us that that is a terrible name. You know, I hate that because we just moved from disconnect you, and now we're supposed to uh, call these young people opportunity you. I'm telling you, it doesn't move the needle with elected officials, and we've got to find uh, uh, a descriptor that motivates or we're going to lose uh, before we ever begin. That's number one. You know, so, 
what policies are we talking about? And where is the, the locus of those? How can we better describe these young people? The area that I think folks who have been working in this arena have done an exceptional job, and we need to ramp that up, is, is the cost not just to the young people, but the cost to communities and the commonwealth if we don't address this issue in creative, aggressive, and proactive ways, whether it's economic development or healthcare or education attainment, those 70,000 people, those 70,000 young people demand our best thinking and heartfelt commitment. Uh, I will tell you that from KYA's perspective, we think that the moment to move ahead is the 2022 General Assembly. I enter that with lots of optimism that if we can paint the picture artfully, we can really make a difference for those young people in policies, in budget opportunities that many of your groups would benefit from. So uh, I want you to see this as a, a a uh, tremendous challenge, but a tremendous opportunity. Nikki, I've probably taken too long, but I just wanted to kind of paint the picture in terms of what's the status, what's the challenge, and what's the opportunity. So thanks for all of you being here, especially thanks to the panelists. And uh, I think most of you know, you're not gonna get somebody who thinks about this uh, more acutely or with more compassion than my colleague, Nikki. So it's it's an honor to kind of end this with you. Go for it. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for sharing the information. And good morning to everyone. It's so nice to see you all, some familiar faces and some new faces as well. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, as Terry said, for such an important topic. Um, and we're so lucky to have uh, young people, young adults, um, as part of this uh, participation and as part of our panel as well. So I will introduce myself. As Terry said, um, my name is Nikki Thornton. I work um, as the executive Executive Director for TrueUp, um, and also that's in partnership with the Kentucky Youth Advocates, and we're really excited about that opportunity to expand our services and resources across the state. Um, and so the work we do is to support young people that have a foster care history ages 16 and older, and we do that by collaborating with our community our community partners and organizations. And as a team, um, we all work together um, to help our young people get to the um, successes that they want to achieve. So I'm so excited to facilitate today's conversation. Um, I am so excited as well about this panel that we have. And we certainly want to um, start our conversation with good news, with celebrations about our young people, with any stories you wanna drop in the chat and any stories that our panelists wanna share um, as I introduce them about successes um, and the way that our young people view successes of our, of our um, interactions with them, of our observations of our young people, just the great things that are happening in our communities that our young people are contributing to. And so we wanna start in a very uh, uplifting uh, way as I introduce our panel. And please, again, drop in the chat any of those experiences that you've had with young people where they have just shined and thrived um, and they are moving possibly from an opportunity youth into another uh, into another situation or just in general, you know, those interactions you have to, with young people that make you smile, um, that remind us of why we are so passionate about this work. So please share those with us in the chat and panelists as I introduce you, um, please uh, feel free as well to share any stories that you would like um, for, for the participants to know. So we'll get started. Um, I'm so happy to um, see some, uh, a couple of people from Northern Kentucky. Um, we've done some work together in the past. So I wanna introduce uh, one of our panelists, um, Don Carson. And Don is the Street Outreach Supervisor at the Brighton Center in Northern Kentucky. So Don, thank you so much for being here. Um, with Don is also um, uh, uh, another one of her colleagues. And I wanna introduce Kate Arthur. And Kate, it's nice to meet you. Kate is the Community and Youth Services Director at Brighton Center as well. Um, Roan Head is with us today, and it's great to see you again, Roan. And Roan is gonna share some of the experiences um, that uh, have occurred uh, throughout our community. So that's gonna be really good to hear from you, Roan. And then we have Daryl Young Jr. 
and Daryl, good morning. Nice to see you. And Daryl is the first um, executive director of the Coalition Supporting Young Adults. And so we're just so excited to have this panel uh, with us this morning. We feel like we have really been able to um, not only just uh, bring a perspective that's from Louisville, which is, which is where I'm located, but also from another part of the state. And there may be various participants here today that can share some experiences too in the chat uh, about the, the area where you come. Uh, come and join us. So let me start with the panelists. Any great stories, good stories, celebration, good news that you all want to share uh, with, with the participants today about the young people that you work with? And we can just stay in that order of Don, Kate, Roan, Durrell, or anyone um, who, may wanna, who may want to uh, just share with us, take a few minutes and share uh, our celebrations. Hi, so I'm going to talk about our young couple. Um, Nikki and I actually work together with these young people. Um, many barriers here in Northern Kentucky, um, trying to find them housing. Uh, they spent nine months sleeping in a tent um, in the woods. And um, they were former foster youth. And so the Project Life, um, well, I guess I should say the Northern Kentucky um, independent living coordinator suggested maybe they would have better luck in Louisville. Um, so I'd reach out to Nikki and we partnered with the Project Life in Louisville and some other places. And um, we were able to get these kids in a hotel and now they're housed um, in their first apartment. Um, they have jobs now. Um, they're looking forward to getting their GED, um, going on to college. Um, and it's just wonderful to see, you know, it was nine months of no 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 and then finally everything just worked out so wonderfully for them so we're so happy um hi i'm kate and i'll, I'll go next uh, in our order um i there's so many so many successes um so many collaborations and partnerships that make it all work um i'm thinking one more recently that we had a youth last August who had been staying in the woods with a mother who was arrested. Long story short, he walked up to our door and said, can you help us? Can you help me? Um, and so we got him into our emergency shelter. Um, and from there, into, we kept him from August until April. He had not been in formal school since eighth grade, and he was 17 and a half. So multiple systems, um, the Covington School District, GED, we had to work with multiple systems to try to get an education that he would attend. Um, because we can't put them in ninth grade at 17 and a half. Um, and as Terry talked about policies that jumped in my head, that he wasn't allowed to enter GED or take a GED um, because, until he was 18. When they did the testing at school, he mastered the level of a senior. And this is a kid who had not been in school. When we took him to practice GED tape test, he blew them away. So basically, um, we partnered with a local school who does GED programming and they allowed him to attend classes as a GED and we're teaching him pre-college um, things. And so then on his 18th birthday, we signed up for the GED. He went through all four tests, boom, boom, boom. And from there, he's now in his own apartment. He's working full-time at Chick-fil-A and meeting with two different colleges to decide, um, we, we call him our homeless to Harvard kid. <laughs> I mean, to have no formal education and walk in and take GEDs and be done is um, just super amazing to know we do have a good good youth here to, to push forward. So um, I think that's the one right now that kind of stands out because multiple systems had to agree that the policy didn't work for him. And so they were all flexible enough to work together to come up with a plan that then made him stick to education, made him complete it, and he's on the road to success. So. Am I next in the order? Okay. A um, couple things. Uh, we started, I want to say back in May, early June, a mental health research project. It was in partnership of CSYA and Kentucky Youth Advocates, um, specifically to help identify some of the stop gaps in the mental health services that we're seeing here in Louisville. Um, so we managed to get that survey launched and live. In the upcoming weeks, we'll actually be analyzing some of that data. Um, so it was a few other youth and I that have come together to help design the survey and just kind of help set some of the priorities. We'll also be holding a couple focus groups to help um, 
get some more uh, fine tuned um, suggestions on some things that could help fix it. Um, so that's really exciting. And then the other thing would be Job Corps finally um, managed to move forward with their remote learning. So me and a few other students that had been put on hold since March of 2020, now we finally get to start moving towards um, starting our trades, um, uh, doing a little bit of the online work before we get to go on campus. So things are finally moving forward and that's worth praising. I just go ahead and lift up um, what Ron had just shared because we are so excited to be working with KYA um, for that youth led mental health research project. Um, and if you know me, I'm a big advocate of, you know, centering youth voice and seeing youth in leadership and giving them real meaningful roles in projects. So to see this project be youth led, um, youth directed to me is just really powerful and it really just shows um, the power of giving youth autonomy and agency within a program and, and you know, what are some real ways to do that? And then um, I'm just more than confident in the success that's gonna, that's gonna happen um, and the number of youth that we can reach with that approach. So we just wanna look at the good work that Ron and the others um, that uh, KYA are doing. And happy that uh, CSYA is supporting that project. Thank you all. You know, we, we certainly want to just always put, as you said, Daryl, at the center that our young people are assets to our community. They contribute um, to our community. And we all have a role, of course, uh, in, in helping um, in any ways that we can uh, for that to happen. So thank you all for starting off this panel discussion with those positive stories. And as you said, Kate, there's so many, it's even hard to choose which one to share. Um, but we just wanted to start uh, this morning in that way. So let me uh, transition just a little bit here. Um, Certainly, we talk about, um, you know, opportunities where young people get connected and they're able to, you know, work on goals as, as things were mentioned. Um, you know, there also are several challenges um, that our young people are still facing uh, and within our communities. We want to take a minute to just, you know, speak to some of those particular challenges that you all see uh, as you're doing the work uh, within our young people and share that with our participants today. So barriers we are seeing. How much time do we have? <laughs> um, I think our biggest barrier is the, so when we're working with um, the local LPCs and we're doing the, um, you know, the local prioritization and the whole COCs and everything, it said our youth do not take a priority. Um, there's very, there's no transitional housing right now in Northern Kentucky. Um, and when we do VI spadats with our youth, um, they score very low. They don't have that chronic homelessness yet because of their ages. Um, they don't have a lot of the risk factors. So it's really being creative and finding alternatives for them. Um, emergency shelters are full. Um, so it's, it's doing things like um, partnering with you, Nikki, and working with Project Life for foster youth. Um, we did have experience working with Job Corps, where we had a youth that was in Job Corps and we couldn't get them into emergency shelters. So um, Cincinnati Job Corps had closed, Cleveland Job Corps was opening. So there were phone calls to Washington, there were phone calls to Chicago, there was ways to um, get him moved from Cincinnati to Cleveland so that he wasn't on the streets homeless. Um, there's other scenarios, you know, different ways that we try to work around those, but really like the biggest one is getting the kids off the streets and out of crisis so that we can move forward with um, getting them thinking about finishing school, finding jobs, you know, because right now they're just in the moment. Um, and then the other thing Kate had already mentioned where they have to now wait till they're 18 to get a GED. You know, these kids are already so far behind for whatever reason. And now they have to wait till they're 18 to really be able to finish getting that education. Because like she said, you know, they're so far behind, put them in ninth, 10th grade at 18 years old, 17 years old. Um, but I need to be some, some changes there that need to be made so that, you know, kids can pursue their GED sooner. Um, the, Cause that also like we partner with our Kentucky Career Center that has the WIOA funds. 
Um, but so many of our youth aren't eligible for those WIOA funds because they're not ready to go into jobs because um, those center around them being graduated, being job ready. So now we're having to back up and do all these things to get them ready for those, you know, um, apprenticeships and internships um, so that they can even just learn trades. Um, if they don't want to go on to college so that they can pursue, you know, some sort of career education. Um, and I think those are our two biggest, two biggest barriers that we're seeing right now. So I second um, what Dawn said and to go a little bit further um, in Northern Kentucky, we have not been able to um, get funds to allow for a shelter for that age group. Um, we have a shelter for up to age 18. Um, whether they're in foster youth or not foster youth, we have that shelter. We do not for that next age group, nor do we have a drop in center. Um, so the third floor of our shelter where street outreach is kind of access that where they can come in and do laundry, come in and get food, come in and sit down and you know work on computers and talk to us. But I think when I think about policy changes and things, um, education is huge. We're, we're really missing out. We, we're getting many foster youth in the shelter at 17, uh, 17 and a half that are not prepared to work or to go on to post-secondary because they can't get their high school diploma. So looking at a policy that will allow for um, you know, schools to be more, more have more flexibility, more alternative programs for those youth, to allow them to be ready to take their GED at 18 um, and not have them doing art and music when they really still need to learn the basics of math and English. And so I think you know, having um, an education institute, all of them um, coming together to create a, a school environment for those youth would be a phenomenal success. Um, and I also think that the barriers they run into are our systems, our systems to get IDs, our systems to do anything, um, to get their food stamps. Uh, the systems are difficult for us to navigate. We've been doing it for 40 years. So uh, for them to navigate those systems is difficult. And, and you know, we can do that with them. But I think we get a youth in, we get them fed, showered, their laundry done and say, okay, come back tomorrow, we're gonna do this. And, and we lose them because they go on the street somewhere and someone else says, oh, go do this. Or they think their hope is gone. Like we have, to, we have to really spark that hope on day one of meeting them that they keep coming back so we can keep engaging them. Um, our landlords are not at all open. We've done a number of work, Brighton Center three years, three, four years ago, did focus groups across the area here to try and engage landlords to understand the needs of these youth and the support we would provide if they would rent to them. Um, especially with COVID and things that happen, landlords are less likely and they want them to have three times the income and all of those things and credit histories. You can't have a credit history at 18. Um, so it's, I'm sure across the state, we're all facing the same things. Um, I get very jealous of some of the resources that are out there and I wanna learn how to bring those resources into Northern Kentucky. So I'm hoping to get more from that. So a few different um, things that I've noticed, this is both from personal experience and just a couple things I've heard uh, working in safe places, drop-in centers, a peer support. Um, the big one, especially around the beginning of 2020, right as soon as everything was closing down, a lot of people would have been either seniors, graduating high school, or trying to come out of college into the job market. Everything closed down, so your general pathways of opportunity were closed for anywhere to six, eight months, a year, sometimes longer, depending on the sector. Um, and that type of being put in limbo um, creates, again, like the feelings of hopelessness, feelings of just not being able to adequately prepare for the world for the sole fact that everything you've been told from kindergarten to uh, 12th grade and then even beyond about what to expect from the world doesn't make sense. You can't go out and get a job if everything's closed. You can't necessarily go out and get housing if the housing isn't there. People aren't necessarily moving because they have to shelter in place, etc. This was really compounded, especially amongst um, a couple different high school seniors that we had to work with. Um, just even like simple things of applying to college that wasn't available to them. So they had to kind of piece together another plan. Um, and oftentimes it would be uh, usually like low income jobs that are typically inflexible in their hours. You don't know your schedule ahead of time. 
So you get your schedule every two weeks and then that's what you work. It could be um, 6 a.m. to noon and then the next day you work 6 p.m. to midnight and be expected to come back in at 6 a.m. to noon again, um, having no time to go home, sleep, uh, prepare for the next day. Um, then the other thing would have been just, again, uh, general access to um, mental health care, things like that. Um, Again, pandemic accelerated the rate of disconnection. Um, if you're trying to go in pulling from personal experience, just to even see a therapist once or twice a week or maybe once or twice a month if you don't feel that it's that necessary. If you're in a situation um, for me to get off the streets, I ended up working seven days a week. It was uh, Monday through Thursday. I worked as an intern at Safe Place through KYCC's program. That's Kentucky Youth Career Center. Um, which was a great uh, program um, in terms of just uh, helping get connected to a type of career field that wasn't your standard retail. It helped uh, actually get me a permanent position at Safe Place for a few years. Um, but on top of working there, I also just to have make ends meet and then also to get out of the weather, work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Kroger. That was seven days a week. And with that rotating schedule, I had to just completely opt out of therapy altogether. There just wasn't time. Um, and uh, typically, if you're on the streets, all it takes is about 90 days of being unsheltered or uh, ha uh, housing unstable to start developing severe mental illness. Um, and these types of things compound over time. It really is a race against the clock to help just mitigate the cost for mental health services and mitigate the costs of physical health. Because um, if you're unsheltered, you're dealing with the extreme heat, you're not able to keep um, adequate nutrition. If you're expected to come in to work before, say, Salvation Army or any of the other shelters uh, serve food, you can't take your medicine. You just have to go and work and deal with the side effects of not taking your medicine on time, if at all that day. Um, there are definitely some ways that we can help mitigate some of these things, but these are just a few very unique challenges that people are constantly having to juggle just to even get their foot in the door. This isn't even having the stability to build off of um, the first three years or it's usually a little bit more than three years, but typically you look at the first three years of your employment history, whatever pay rate that you're at, say you make 745, that affects your entire trajectory over the entire course of your life. So um, part of it is valuing the input that young people have. They're very quick at learning. Um, it heavily depends on getting them connected to a healthy network of people. So again, um, if these people are disconnected because they can't go into your normal paths, um, you see these people definitely help get them connected to people in your own network. Um, find those little things that they are very um, intelligent at, whether it be communication or technology or these little things. Um, and I'm trying to finish up, I'm sorry. Um, just to help create that network for them because if they're not able to get that from their home, if they're not able to get that through the usual means of high school into work or high school into college, um, it's speeds up that whole rate of disconnection. And the longer we wait, the harder it is to pull them back into the fold. Everything Dylan said was spot on. Um, it's, that's, that's, a, that's a hard act to follow. Um, so thank you, Ron, for sharing that. Um, I'm really just gonna kind of, you know, uh, really reaffirm what everybody else has said, I, I think. There's, there's a myriad of issues, but I think uh, when we talk about some of the most pressing concerns for this population, I think it is, I think it is housing, education, and, and really uh, mental health. Um, we talk about the fact, and just speaking from a perspective um, from, from Louisville, uh, we already know there is a housing crisis and a homelessness crisis here in our city. Um, and if we talk about that just from a general standpoint, if we were to extrapolate it out to young people, um, it's even worse when we think about the fact that we really don't have the means or the infrastructure right now to differentiate, you know, youth housing and general population housing and the kind of complications that causes. Um, I, I know some programs uh, do have a, a few number of beds uh, that they designate to youth, but it's still not necessarily, even if it is 
separated for youth and still not necessarily separate out from general population. And the, the number is so low anyway that it, it does not really um, put a drop in the bucket for the number of, of youth in need of those services. Um, so that's that's one area. I think Dylan, I think Ron did a great job of um, touching on the fact of uh, educational pathways. We know that um, COVID really exacerbated the issue uh, of, of disconnected young people trying to get a GED, trying to finish, um, you know, uh, their high school diploma, being behind on credits. We know that so many young people are are really behind in terms of getting their education, and and unfortunately, we have a system that that only prioritizes one set way, really, um, or a really limited myopic scope of ways to, to uh, for a young person to get their uh, education finished. So we have to do a, a much better job. And that's some of the work that CSYA is doing in terms of expanding those educational pathways and, and creating that infrastructure of support for young people. Um, and then lastly, again, uh, we know we have a booming um, mental health need in our communities. Um, I constantly hear young people um, make the call that they need additional mental health support. They need additional mental health treatment. Uh, but we know that one, how do we get uh, mental health practitioners who are culturally competent um, and generationally competent too, right? Um, we do know there is a big generational divide uh, between younger folks and older folks. Um, and then two, we talk about, you know, people who can speak to um, uh, a person of color experience? Can they speak to uh, marginalized communities experience? Um, can they speak to the LGBTQIA plus experience? So not only is there uh, a need for these services, but also do we have the the, the staff and instructor to support those different identities as well as how do we make it affordable for young people too, right? Um, so it is it is really a complex um, set of issues that our young people are are up against. Thank you all for sharing and thank you, Ron, for giving us a, a young adult's perspective, personal and, and professional, uh, of some of the things that, that just have to be navigated on a daily basis. Um, I want to move a little bit, um, Daryl, you, you touched on this. Uh, when we talk about um, not just offering services, but offering individualized, tailored, personal, impactful services to our young people, um, we wanted to take a moment to discuss you know, the data. Uh, around race and how certain groups of young people, African American uh, young people, other groups of young people uh, that have been raised uh, within your conversation, Daryl, um, they're, they're more at risk. The data tells us that. Um, and just how are you all navigating those pieces? How are you all seeing that play out when, again, we're, we're wanting to give our young people our best services that are tailored and unique to them, not necessarily just the services that are available or in the community, but that really are going to fit um, the needs of our young people. Um, if you all could kind of speak to how you're um, seeing some of the, the data pieces, like I said, around race with African Americans, other groups, um, play out in your programming uh, in your, in your, and your interactions. And then, you know, what are ways that you're really trying to be intentional around meeting those specific needs, those individual needs that our young people have within, within this area? Uh, I think for us in our programming, as things are shifting and, you know, movements happen and, you know, people are becoming more aware, um, we do have more um, young people of color coming forward wanting help, um, where before they didn't, um, you know, they just kind of wanted to stay in the shadows, um, you know, because they were afraid. Um, so, uh, I guess you could say we're learning like everyone else. Um, we just, we're, we're doing everything we can to get them the best services that we can. But again, um, you know, there still are barriers there. Um, for the mental health, um, touching on that though, I think our biggest thing is we can get our kids like services for mental health, but they have to want it. And so when they, they don't wanna take medications and they don't like the way the medications make them feel or this reason or the other, um, there's nothing to say they have to. Um, you know, we have Casey's Law for kids with substance abuse issues or people in general with substance abuse issues, um, but nothing for kids with mental health issues. Um, so I just kind of wanted to touch on that, but um, 
yeah, I mean, we're learning as our agency is, is making vast strides in, you know, changing policies and creating more equity and equality. And um, I think as it continues to grow, we're going to see more more people needing and wanting help. Um, and it's just making sure, you know, that the barriers just keep coming down so that they can get the help that they need. Um, and we just keep learning as um, providers how to how to get them those services. Um, I, I think um, going back, um, Brighton Center a couple of years ago started working on a race forward um, out of California. Uh, so we started this journey in, in Brighton Center a couple of years ago. And, uh, and of course, with um, what sparked with George Floyd, lots of different things we had to dig deeper quicker. And Dawn's right. I think as we changed some of the ways we did things, which were very small changes, um, I think youth of color felt more welcome, felt more trusting because we're out there talking about race. We're out there talking about those things and they see that we're making those efforts. Um, one of the first things we did was in our department met with our um, black staff and said, tell us how you feel here. You know, are we often, you know, it was the probably, I mean, I've been in this 40 some years. It was probably the most educational two hours I spent. It was amazing. Um, little things like, coming into a shelter, because in Northern Kentucky, we have a small, you know, a small minority of African-Americans. So we didn't have the shampoo, the condition, those kind of just basic things. Um, so that that youth all of a sudden was like, oh, I'm different because they have to go to Walmart and get this. So that doesn't no longer happen. So just small little uh, changes. Our at-risk group, we used to always say, you know, be respectful of the police, you know, act this way. And now we identify. You're African American. You are more at risk. I'm sorry to tell you that, but you're a young male black youth, and and they're going to talk to you differently, and you're going to have to respond differently. And you know, really getting down and talking. Um, but I think as that got out, we did see more um, youth of color coming because they know we're talking, we know we're helping them. We know that I think they under, they know we what their needs are. You know, they that they do have the things that they need to have dealt with. But with landlords. Um, you know, we're, we're up against it. That's just another challenge. And we recognize that and we talk about it. So as a community and as a, an agency, we're pulling all our partners in to say, hey, we have to stand together and make some changes in the community, not just your own job, not just your own place, but across the, across the communities. Um, the mental health area for me is, I, I loved what you said, Daryl. I, I think it's right on. The therapists don't meet the needs of those youth. They're, they're, there's no trust. There's no building. They don't they come in with their theories and their understanding, but they're not connecting with that youth, so they don't go back. Um, they, they don't feel heard and they don't feel understood. I, I think you were spot on with better training in, in different areas, especially the cultural competency pieces. Um, we also know our Latino community does not access services easily. Um, and we have found that we've been able to hire staff, Latino staff, and then we see more of those cultural people coming forward. And so we're starting in hiring. Who do, you know, who do we look like and what do you look like and can you come here and, and feel comfortable? So um, we're digging in pretty deep and we are seeing you know, some changes happen with that and, and we're real pleased with that, but we all have a long way to go. I will try to keep this concise. I am not exactly 100% sure what my thoughts are on all this, so please bear with me um, in general. Just um, from data I've been able to pull on the national level, but also just kind of what I've seen in Safe Place. Um, as general, uh, males don't seek help. It's kind of a cultural thing um, that we're supposed to, you know, stand up, be tough, not supposed to show emotion. Um, you can see it in advertisements. You can see it in the way uh, teachers talk about it in school. I can't count how many times it's always been. Um, it usually says, uh, come on, big, strong boys, uh, come up and help move all the chairs or whatever it is. And that's not a big deal, but it's kind of this um, mentality that you have to put that forward, that um, empathy and these things are weaknesses when they really aren't. If you have the wherewithal to acknowledge what's going on in your heart and the strength to face it, that's um, if you think like a little sailboat and the um, sale and everything, that there is the wind that's gonna push you forward in terms of being able to handle life challenges and being able to tackle these tough problems. If we're looking at demographically, yes, um, African-American males, people that are just not white in general, do face a little bit uh, higher rates of the disconnection. If we're gonna do a ratio, if uh, say 
one is the ratio of white males for black males it's half of that number that actually get to access or um get quality treatment and even then the numbers of directed treatment for what they're uh, experiencing as low um, in some cases as low as 10 percent of those people that are seeking services so if we're taking half 10 percent of the half that's minuscule um the other thing it would be um, just from and again it wasn't necessary if therapist setting, but in terms of like a drop in center in terms of providing peer support. So making the connection on common experience, um, especially for people that were not um, your standard demographics so white people outside of that. Really, all they needed is just to have some space for them to let out emotion. And we do have this weird uh, concept of what anger is. And it's not that it's a bad emotion. It's um, and many times it's secondary to sadness and just the disconnect and to not being seen. Use whatever descriptor that you want. And these people do need to get loud. They do need to get it out because it's uh, for years upon years upon years, they haven't been able to say anything about it. They haven't been able to even address that this is a thing. So when you finally do burst that bubble and all that comes up, it's going to come out loud because this is the first time I'm going to be heard. I need to make sure I'm heard. Um, so understanding that these people, when they do get louder, when they do, and this is not just um, people that are not white, this is white people too. Um, so uh, whenever it's time to get loud, um, to understand that it's not a, a per coming from a person, place of personal attack or anything, it's just, you're finally hearing me, I'm glad to hear me. So once they first get that uh, tidal wave of emotion out to kind of come back and say, hey, I hear you. Um, these are the kinds of things that you brought up. These are a couple of things that we might be able to address. What sounds good to you? Um, how can we put this treatment self-directed to you? Um, and once you've kind of made that connection, once they start feeling seen, the conversation shifts. It's no longer about needing to be heard. It's like, okay, what can we do? Um, and that's usually the first step of trying to get someone into therapy is, um, for them to be seen, for them to be heard, and um, not to feel like that they have to be a medical guinea pig in terms of mental, or not mental, like medical treatment in terms of medicine. Medicine is a great band-aid, but if we're not, if we equate it to a medical tool, it's a band-aid. If we don't clean the wound, if we don't let it, um, if we don't treat the infection underneath and we just slap that band-aid on top, it's not going to fix the issue. You have to uh, tackle it in tandem. So that would be therapy, that would be in some cases, medicine that would be getting them out of the situation that had brought them to that point of whatever toxicity is within themselves, without themselves. So that would be in the grand, or greater society around them, if that makes sense. I'm really thankful for the order that we're going in because I, I love playing uh, uh, cleanup for, for Rome because uh, uh, they've just been so spot on and uh, it helps me it helps me make my points um, and go on a, a, a little more in depth. Um, so <clears throat> Nikki, when you talked about you know the original question asking you know how are you seeing these disparities play out in the work, I, I'll just give uh, two examples, two really clear examples of, of, of how we're seeing these things play out. I know I think we're, we're probably running up on time, but you know when we talk about um, the rate of disconnection um, in Louisville. When we looked at, you know, the article that the Courier published in 2019, uh, versus where we're at now, um, there were about 17,000 um, youth who would, who would fall under the category of opportunity or disconnected youth. Um, and we know that number has gone up dramatically because of COVID. Um, but when we looked at that number, we, we saw that um, one in four of those young people um, were Black or African American. Um, so just a really real, um, you know, number of how, what that looks like and how it plays out. And then also, again, you've heard me talk about um, CSYS push for educational reengagement, supporting that population of young people to um, find alternative pathways and create a, uh, infrastructure for young people to complete their education. Um, Pre-pandemic numbers, um, we had about 9,000 young people who um, were behind in credits or could not complete a, a diploma or GED. Um, after COVID, that number is almost quadrupled. Um, with that, when we look at that by race, we realize that African Americans are 
uh, almost 18% more likely to be disconnected um, or 18% more likely to be behind in credits um, than their, their peers. Um, and what I loved about Rome's uh, commentary was the, uh, the, the, the call to actually address the, the underlying issues. So I think when we talk about these populations, right, whatever marginalized population you want to talk about, you want to talk about um, Black folks, you want to talk about LGBTQIA plus folks, you want to talk about, um, you know, our immigrant population, any, any kind of population that you want to talk about, I think when we hear these statistics, our, our mind can automatically go to, well, what are they doing wrong? Or, oh, they're just not trying hard enough. Or how come they can't just get it together like their peers? And I think we don't do enough to ask, what is happening within the system that perpetuates these outcomes for this particular subset of people? And I think when we don't get to, to that part of the commentary, I think we still fall into this trap of just believing, oh, well, they're probably just not trying hard enough. Or, oh, why do we have to hear about these kids who just need mental health? They, why can't they just toughen up and just, you know, get it together? And, and we kind of start having those kind of, you know, uh, commentary. And some of them are sophisticated and some of them are just as, um, obtuse is how I made it sound right. It was working to get together, but you know, you can doctor that up and use a lot of, you know, clinical, uh, comp, you know, uh, uh, language, um, but still saying the same thing. I think to, to Ron's point, um, we really have to address why are we seeing these outcomes and what are, what are, what are, what are we seeing in these systems that keep on perpetuating these outcomes for these specific communities and populations over and over and over again. Because at some point we have to say, is it really a problem with, with black children or is there something happening to black children that are, that are causing them to have these disparities and whatever uh, marginalized population you want to put on that. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you for sharing some of the numbers as well. I think it really gives us perspective uh, when, you, when you start to, to look at those numbers and hear what those numbers uh, are, are saying. Um, why don't we uh, close out this panel uh, in a way where, you know, we know there are some innovative programs happening um, across the state. Um, I want just to give you all a moment, again, as we close out, uh, and, and I'll pass it over to my colleague Kish uh, here in a few minutes. Um, let's uh, speak a little bit about those uh, programs and, and those uh, opportunities that are happening in your communities. I know Northern Kentucky, you all have some things to share with us. We've got some great things happening here in Louisville and across the state. Please put it in the chat. You know, I see the chat is active. Please uh, share those resources, share those uh, programs and, and opportunities that you are seeing uh, in your areas. But let's take a moment to, to speak to that. And then would you please just add to that maybe one thing in terms of a state policy uh, changes that you all think would really uplift our young people. So if you can speak about, you know, some of those programs uh, that are innovative, that, that are happening, that we're trying and you're seeing successes or hopeful uh, that you're going to see success based on the data you've done, the research you've done, and then maybe one piece on uh, state policy that would really change the game um, for our young people. Right. I'm just going to speak real quickly so Kate can talk about our Opportunity House that will be opening. Um, for me, uh, federal change would be great. Um, my grant is for 16 up to the age of 22. Um, I would love to see that go to the age of 24 um, and not stop there on that 22nd birthday. You know, I don't like having to turn my kids over to an adult system at the age of 22. Um, the mental health is a big deal. The education is a big deal, um, but I'm going to let Kate talk. Thanks for having me on here today. Thanks, Don. So Brighton Center is very excited. We've been working for a number of years on one of our strategic plans for the agency has been the 16 to 24 year old opportunity youth. And there are tons of challenges, but we're trying to knock those down. And we've been able to partner with, and it's a great partnership with um, Highland Heights, Northern Kentucky University, um, you know, Brighton Center themselves. And the governor came up and presented us with a million dollars to renovate a building on in, at the foot of NKU campus, Northern Kentucky University campus. So that will be our building and we will be opening next summer for 16 efficiency of units, apartments there for youth to be able to attend any accredited post-secondary education. So taking that housing challenge away, they will have section eight housing, they can live there, they can do the fast so all of their education could be free 
Um, and we're very, very excited because we know this changes the trajectory for those youth. And it's 16 and it's little, but it's there and they can do certificate programs, two-year programs, four-year programs at um, the multiple schools around our area. They can be from anywhere in the state. They don't have to be from Northern Kentucky. Um, we're really excited about that. We know that only 10%, less than 10% of foster youth complete post-secondary education. We wanna change that number. Um, so it's been approved by the Office of Inspector General for Independent Living. They can stay there. Um, we have all the approvals and everything's in place and we're just shouting it out. Um, so, you know, please reach out if you have any questions about that or you have seniors or youth that are gonna be getting their GED that wanna do that. We can knock down all the obstacles they have. We'll do the applications. Rowan, like you talked about, we'll sit and do applications with them to colleges. We'll do the FAFSA with them. We'll do all of that um, to ensure that, that they have the best opportunity. So we're excited about that, but please reach out with any questions. As far as policy changes, the, the GED is just a big, big deal. Um, and even though Governor Bevan changed and said foster youth can get their GED before they're 18, the federal people say, no, they can't. So we've been you know, knocking our heads back and forth between that. Um, we have some great folks trying to be innovative about it, but we do need that policy. And I think that looking at HUD to identify across everywhere that there's rapid rehousing funds specifically for opportunity youth. Um, not ones that they have to share or wait in line for, but funds specified just for opportunity use. Okay, a couple different program pieces that um, have taken place in Louisville is we've started integrating uh, peer support across the board, at least in as many places that make sense. So peer support, uh, just to be concise, is um, built on the um, pretext that we or people know what's best for them. And it's just a matter of getting to the uh, like meat of the conversation, finding out what that piece of truth is, and then expanding on that. And it's supposed to be self-directed. So as a peer support, you come in and say someone wants to work on this, you work on it at their pace where they start. Um, it's heavily uh, self-directed. Um, you might ask some questions uh, to get to the um, more like finer points of it, like what are some of the blind spots that we're not seeing, et cetera, um, to bring out a more effective change. Um, we've seen some of this in just not just like some uh, medical settings, but also um, in a couple different programs. So the book works um, in tandem with young people coming in and uh, learning the process of uh, like starting a small business in terms of like um, how to manage things say if we're using used books like how to put them online how to sort them what to look for etc and through this process of just getting these basic job skills of like how to show up and how to engage in a proper manner um, there's a lot of conversation around what are the things that we're looking out for what are the um, things that are going on in your head and your heart that might make the situation difficult how do we tackle those things um, what types of skills do we need to build in you to help circumvent that and that's expanded onto the Rosewater too, and a nonprofit bookstore in the area that works in tandem. So uh, young adults can come in, um, stock the books, have conversations with people, build some of those soft skills in terms of engaging with the broader public without it being incredibly um, restrictive as you have to be here from this hour to this hour every single day of the week, which is a big step for people if you're coming in and um, you struggle even with an introduction with people. Um, as for policy changes, this one was really hard as I don't know a whole lot of grander policy, but through some research, one little uh, thing that I've noticed is typically when it comes to, um, at least with billing insurance in terms of uh, getting services in general, there's a bit of a disparity between physical health and mental health. Um, so if we're putting at payout, which is typical for both uh, Medicaid and private insurance, uh, if you're going to a doctor's office and you're going for a general checkup, you're looking at that being paid completely off. You don't necessarily have to go out of network for that. But when we start dropping down to mental health, which in a way is also physical health, if your brain's not healthy, it affects everything else in your body. We're starting to see, and this is specific to Kentucky, um, on the grander scale, it's also pretty bad. But in Kentucky, you're looking at about 75% of the payout. Um, so either the therapist, whoever it is, has to um, just eat that cost or they have to pass it on to whoever that they are serving. And that's not always feasible if you're working a low-end job that doesn't pay well, doesn't offer benefits. 
Um, and this is even worse when it comes to um, especially private insurance. So if you're not, or if you're making too much, can't rely on Medicaid, have to rely on um, employer sponsored, you're looking at, so if we're looking at a rate of one for people having to leave uh, their network to get physical health when it comes to mental health, um, and this is data up to 2017, so it's a little bit out of date, it might have gone down a little bit, but basically it was five times higher the rate of you if you're seeking mental health services, whether that be therapy, whether that be getting medicine, whether that's trying to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you're five times more likely to have to leave your network provider to get that service. And that's that's out of pocket cost. Um, so that's a huge barrier in terms of just trying to get that. So if we're looking at legislatively trying to close that gap between the amount of payouts, so from 75% to 100%, and then um, to keep updated the different directories for services, I'm not joking. I had to take a client to a therapy appointment once in on Google. I pulled up what was their therapist's office. We went and checked really quick. I guess I got a number wrong or something. It took me to a White Castle. That's not a therapist's office. So making sure that if we're going to be sending people out through insurance, whoever these people are in network, that the information is up to date, that they do have availability and it's just not dead information. And in, in terms of exciting projects, I think, you know, I, I mentioned the really great work that we are doing with KYA um, in terms of the um, youth mental um, health led project. Also, we were able to work with KYA to produce a set of policy recommendations um, that we are really excited to be rolling out here shortly. You'll be seeing that um, very soon. I think it's really important that we really understand the um, record level of funding coming into um, our state with the American Rescue Plan and really making sure that that money goes specifically to uh, this population that we're talking about, that we care about. And also what I would say in terms of policy, and this is something that I've noticed here on a local level, um, is that there's so much attention, and rightfully so, to early childhood, right? Um, and we know all the indicators um, for levels of success. We know um, the correlation between the school to prison pipeline. If young people aren't, you know, reading at a, you know, on level by the fourth grade, their um, instances to be, you know, all the all those negative indicators come out in, in early childhood. Um, but there's there's a, a really shrinking um, level of support for for that older population, the youth that we're talking about. For us, we're talking about opportunity, we're talking about 16 to 24. Um, and just seeing the dwindling amount of resources for that population. And I think we make that an either or conversation when it needs to be a both and conversation. Um, and I think now that we have this level of funding coming into our city um, and to our state, uh, we don't have to, we don't have to uh, cut the pie so drastically anymore, right? Uh, we can do both and we can do both really well. Um, and then just last thing I'm just really excited about is the amount of training that we can do to, again, create those levels of support for young for, for young people. So, you know, going with these um, trainings on educational advocacy, educational re-engagement, you know, taking this tool that we created for um, uh, uh, multiple educational pathways and making sure our friskies, our counselors, um, our school system, our um, out of school time, um, OST sites across the city have this tool um, so that uh, we're we are creating a, a no wrong door system in, in, in our city um, where if a youth shows up uh, there, they can be supported. Thank you all. Thank you so much to our panelists. Really appreciate you all being here today. Kish, thank you um, as you've been waiting to close us out. You, we certainly want to uh, do that for anyone who can remain uh, on here. Um, just again, to thank the, the panel and thank the participants. A very important conversation uh, and I've learned a lot. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Kish Kumi Price and she's gonna close us out today. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you for uh, moderating so beautifully. Thank you, Daryl, Don, Kate, and Rowan for such expertise um, on this topic. And thank you everybody for um, tuning in. I just wanna go back to very quickly saying that in 2019, we had 70,000 opportunity youth in Kentucky. And I am a Cards fan. Um, if we look at the Yum Center, 
that's three young centers full of kids or opportunity youth young adults filling those seats and some so that's that's a big issue we need to be talking about how to change these systems and to create more opportunity. So I'm so grateful that we are lifting this up and continue to do so. Um, we wanna thank Aetna Better Health of Kentucky for their support of today's Advocate Virtual Forum. And as always, the follow-up email will include a recording of today's forum along with the resources we discussed and a link to sign up for next week's forum on LGBTQ plus youth. Thanks again for joining us and hope you have a great rest of your day. Be great.